poet is born, not made. A man is not a poet unless there is some peculiar event in his family history to account for him. The poet, like his poetry, is himself the result of the fusion of incongruous forces. So states Robert Graves, the poet who lives high above the sea in Mallorca. In his youth, the Welsh mountains, which he climbed with Mallory, provided a similar natural release, for he has always been a man to command large horizons. One of the 1418 war poets and friend of Siegfried Sassoon, Graves wrote of his experiences in Goodbye to All That. It remains a classic statement for his generation. Patriotism in the trenches, he wrote, was too remote a sentiment and at once rejected as fit only for civilians. Primarily a poet, Graves is also the author of a large variety of works covering over a hundred titles and including historical novels, translations, mythology, children's books and biographies. He has long made his home in the Mediterranean island of Mallorca, where he lives close to the small Spanish village of Dea. Here, in a house built on the proceeds of his Claudius books, he lives with his second wife and has helped to bring up four of his eight children. He retires to a room at the back of his house to write, using a paintbrush to ink out his mistakes. He claims, in fact, to enjoy rewriting and making it easy for his readers. And here, Graves continues to write, situated appropriately between the mountains and the sea. Tonight, he talks to Malcolm Muggridge about those incongruous forces that have made him what he is. Morgan. The thing is, uh, your ancestry is so extraordinarily mixed, isn't it? Uh, I mean, racially, nationally. Oh, everybody's ancestry is mixed. In fact, um, I can trace my descent, as the Queen does, uh, to the Prophet, Muhammad. Well, that's pretty good. The thing is, but you have got this German, Irish, Danish, and um, Welsh, haven't you? No Welsh. No, no. Welsh. I'm Wait sorry. A German, married Welsh, Irish, I... married Welsh. With German, Irish, Danish, anything else? Scotch. Scotch. Yeah. Scotch. Is that the most important of all? It's what keeps me steady, keeps me here in my seat. The Scotch answers. Yeah. That's your sort of... Uh, Here's the Scotland. <laughs> Quartner. Well, now, which of them do you think was the most important as far as influencing you has been concerned, as far as shaping your life has been concerned, your German or your Dane or your Scottish or your Irish? Or, or my Arabian. Or your this going back, this Mohammed. Oh, yes, yes. Well, I think what happens is that the Scotch and the German and the Danish keep the Irish in check for a long time. Is it still and eventually the Irish breaks through and that takes over. Is that right? I accept that absolutely because I detect in you, I seem to detect in you, a mixture of a tremendously learned, slightly eccentric German professor and a rather amusing, irresponsible Irishman. Is that fair? Well, the Germans were, my, my German ancestry was extremely distinguished. I know it was. Uh, and, and, and very, very solid and very, the father of, uh, in, of uh, modern history was my granduncle, Leopold Rank. von Ranke. Yeah. I but, uh, but listen, let's forget about ancestry. All right. What a tremendous lot of words you've written. I was looking through a list of your books. Many of them the same, of course. <laughs> well, yes, but still they're a lot. Even just to write them, if you, if you repeat yourself a bit, who doesn't? But I suppose that it's your poetry that you care about most. Well, when I'm writing it, yes. But I don't care what happens to it afterwards, really. You never read it or look at it? Well, I revise my poems every few years. But that's the part of your work that you attach importance to, poems. That's my job, yeah. What about all the others? I, Claudius, things like that. Well, I wrote I, Claudius because I was, um, I'd been let down a land deal. I, I was, uh, I had to find 4,000 pounds and I'd mortgaged my house. And uh, I made a note some, a couple of years before, that there was something very wrong with the Claudius story and that the historians weren't telling the truth. And uh, that I'd, it might be a good thing to write if I ever needed the money. And uh, I did need the money, so I wrote it, and I made 8,000 pounds in six months. And that saved my house. And it was purely a practical job. 
and therefore now you disregard that as something that you did to earn money as distinct from poetry, which is you. Poetry is me, yes. Well, why do you write poems? How does it come about? Well, what happens is a sort of cloud descends on you, and uh, you don't know what's happening. And then you suddenly realize that there's something, some ex problem of extreme importance. It's got to be solved, and then you realize that there's a poem around, and then suddenly two words or three words come to your mind, and that gives a start. And, and then you write the poem, and it's as though the poem has already been written, but you're trying to re re reconstitute it. You regard the poem as something already there. You've got to f get back to, to the original, uh, your original view of it. What about... And so you work hard and hard and finally get it back to something near what it really is, was, would be. Could that be compared to what's called a mystical experience? Of course it's mystical, yeah. yeah. Same sort mystical? of thing? Yeah. Same sort of thing. Therefore, it's something that some, some, some reality that you're trying to grasp. Something that's there, as you say, that Something you're trying... Something there has got to be said, and it's, and it's uh, always about... Well, there's, you see, there's, there's the right hand and the left hand. The left hand is, is, the, is the satiric hand. And, and the, uh, the, the right hand is the, is the creative hand. And you write a certain amount of satiric poems and... and uh, but they're left-handers. They're all left-handers, but that's in order to keep an even balance. But the important thing is, is the right hand. Do you feel that you've succeeded at times at any in doing this, in, in, in getting this, this thing out? I mean, that you... Well, when, uh, when you find a poem, you can't do anything more to it, then, it's, then you put it away. But you keep on revising them. Well, it's easy to teach yourself, you see. And very often, you think that you've written a poem that's all right, and then after a time, you realize that in some sm slight way, you've cheated, and then that has to go. Would you say that religion had played much part in your life, really? I mean, in a general sense, white goddess or what? That's religion, well, isn't it? Is that religion? There's a difference between religion and ecclesiasticism. True enough. It's a four, what the Americans call a four-bit word. And uh, I'm not an ecclesiastic. Do Although I, I, I know my Bible better than most priests. I can say so without boasting, because most priests know very little about it. What about Christianity? Do you care for that at all? Listen, we're living in, a, in what's called a Christian age. It's, not, it's a transitional age, and there's a lot of... If you want to know, really... Yes, I do want to know. I have no really. question right. I ever put that I right. don't want to know, really. I was thinking about it the other day, and I decided that what I've been trying to do, really, is to find out what Christianity really is, and to separate the Jewish side of it from the heathen side. <coughs> and if you, um, in um, <coughs> a book called The Nazarene Gospel Restored with Joshua Podro, which is now out of print and will remain out of print because of the unofficial um, religious um, boycott. boycott of it, but which is used in certain theological faculties in certain universities as a sub rosa textbook, because there's no other book on the subject. That has that separates all the Jewish side of Christianity from the Christ, from the. Uh, I, when I say the Christian side, I can use it literally because Christianity wasn't invented until that new side came in, where it becomes a mystery religion of the Greek type. And this so would in the, in be the, Paul. What did you do this with, with Paul and Apollos and, and Simon Magus and other characters? Uh, and I've tried in these two books, the White Goddess and and, and the, the Nazarene Gospel entirely unlike to separate the two. Which is the good and which is the bad? It's not a question of good and bad. It's a question of two, Im, two different sides of Christianity which people have tried to make go together and, and, you which, and which don't go together. And that's why all the, there's all this muddle. Therefore, but if you're going to separate them out, uh, do you discard one? No, I don't discard one. That is a belief. That's the way I of thinking. Understand. That's the way of thinking. No, it's not a question which is better. But what's happening now is uh, people are so worried about religion that they are leave, trying to leave out God. 
And they want to keep Jesus Christ as something apart from God. It doesn't work. Jesus is so rooted in the idea of God that you can't get rid of it. You will have God or nothing. That's what it comes to. Your mother was a very pious woman. Is that right? Was yours? Mine was, yes. Yes, she was, rather. She's a, she, was a, she was going to be a missionary, and, and, and she married my father instead. Yes, and begot you. My mother, women don't beget. All right, your father begot you with my her cooperation. My mother bore you. Your mother bore you, your and, father uh, begot And uh, never bored me. No. Well, I do think that her piety and um, it, it sort of desire to be good played a part in your life? She was a very loving woman. And she had, she married at 35. And after 35, you don't expect children. And she had a girl. That was all right to try on. Then she had another girl. She got rather wide. And then she had me, you see, when she was about 40. And so that was terrific for her. Yes. And, and I think she loved me very dearly, you know. Sure she did. And, well, and I think that was, a, that's, that has got a, had a great help, been a great help to me all my life. One feels that in your book, Act, in, in Goodbye to Oh, she, she, was, she was very cross to me because I did the wrong things. I broke all the social conventions, but it was, you know. But she didn't feel ultimately cross? No. 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 What about Charterhouse? Uh, how did that affect you, going to a public school? You weren't... I read about Charterhouse the other day in, in, in one of these evening papers, somebody writing about it, and saying very much what I had said, only rather more severely. So it's, it must be the same now. Well, I didn't send any of my children there. No. But uh, I don't think they could have taken it, really. You weren't at all happy there, were you? You see, all schools are bad. You mean education? Every bad. school is bad. Education's bad. Education's bad. Every school is I'm, bad. I'm terrific down with the education. only trouble. The trouble is, you've got to get the children out of the parents' hair. So you've got to send them to school. Boarding school? Must be boarding school? I don't know. Now, what about homosexuality at uh, the public schools? Do you think you write a bit about that? I mention homosexuality, but it's, if you keep boys away from girls, then you get homosexuality. Yes. Do you think this is a bad thing to happen? I think schools are bad, just that. Right. And it, it doesn't happen uh, in, in, uh, in other places where you, where, you keep the, where you have boys and girls naturally together, you don't get homosexuality. Do you think the fact that you went through a homosexual phase at Charterhouse uh, influenced you much? It wasn't a homosexual phase. It was no more than, listen, uh, poor old Shakespeare. You see, he wrote those sha he wrote those uh, sonnets. Those sonnets, and he was a he was a he was a playwright, and you know what the stage is like. Mm -hmm. And in those days, all the women's parts were played by boys, and so he naturally got rather sensitive. And the boys can take on over women characteristics and play the woman in an extraordinary way. And it was the woman that was at Shakespeare's was in love with this boy. And then, of course, suddenly he became a man, and the whole thing exactly. uh, ended in tears. Exactly. But, and, uh, but uh, you've got to distinguish between, between homosexuality of one sort and homosexuality in which the boy is playing the woman. Right, I quite understand that distinction. The only thing I wonder is whether, not having been to a school of that kind myself, whether the fact that there, you go through this phase, I mean, looking back on it, whether you think the influence of it is bad or good or large or small. Everything is interesting, isn't it, so to speak? Yes. But it, uh, but it, um, I mean, you don't uh, look back on it as something that was blighting or anything like that. No. No, I'm not a faggot myself. No, I know you're not. You're, Thank you. You're, <laughs> I give you a full, um, full credit for that. Well, now, the th anyway, the thing is that the, f the phase passed. Yes, everything passes, isn't it? Because you're always writing about love and women. The dust cloud passes, everything passes. Everything passes, thank God. You're always writing about love and women in your poems now, aren't you? That's what poetry is mostly about, isn't it? I suppose it is. But I was just wondering w whether that is... I mean, whether, whether that's based on particular people or sort of general emotions when you write a poem about women or disappointed love. Most of your if love... If you ask me for telephone numbers, I'm not going to give you any. <laughs> I don't, I'll, I'm much too old to be able to make any use of your How telephone old are you? number. 62. Boy. What? Mere boy. No, but I, I couldn't make any use of your telephone numbers. I couldn't hope to... Um, I couldn't hope to appear in your, in your place. 
The thing is, um, do you... What are you making me say? <laughs> I don't make you say anything. I'm just exploring the influences which have made your poetry what it is. Now, we come to another great influence in your life, the war, the 1418 war. That was a terrific influence, wasn't it? Oh, yes. You know what Dr. Johnson said? No. He said, uh, I can't remember his exact words, but or what Boswell said they were, but it was that nobody who's not uh, served in, in, in the war has any sense of self-respect, which makes me believe the stories that Dr. Johnson fought uh, with the uh, British troops against the Scots in the... It's, it's interesting. Hmm. I didn't know that. Because you wouldn't say that, you wouldn't say that if you hadn't been in the war. Or did it got <laughs> somehow sort of been... <laughs> anyway, you feel that. Therefore, you look back on this harrowing experience, really with... The, there's a good deal in it that was positive rather than negative. Oh, yes, we were all quite crazy. In a very positive way. Completely crazy. But it, it was a terrific experience and not altogether a, a, a lost one, as it were. Oh, no, rather not. No, it was it was um, it was marvelous because uh, uh, you had but you had in any six weeks you had one chance of being killed, one chance of being wounded, and one chance of being slightly wounded, of severely wounded. Uh, if you were, happened to be an officer, the uh, uh, privates had longer life. The whole it's very simple, but it's all to do with horses. Go on. Because um, you see. Uh, every British officer had to wear um, these um, sort of breeches, breeches. breeches and putties and made it quite a different silhouette. And so the uh, German troops were taught to fire at the officers. Right? They were showed the silhouettes of mm -hmm. English private English officers. So they shot at us. Because in the Second World War, we knew about that. Oh, and yes. we oh, took oh. jolly good care that yes. we were indistinguishable yes, from yes, privates. Yes, that's fine. And what's more, in the Second World War, when you had 10% of casualties, they took you back and they gave you sedatives and they gave you a rest. With us, we went up to 90% casualties, but brought back and recharged and put in again. But you were a terrific gang of neurotics afterwards, the ones of you who got through. Sure, it was, our, it was our adrenaline glands poisoning us. Yes. Yeah. That's all right. Well, what about that? Well, you can't stop glands, can you? No, you can't. Uh, you have to surrender to your glands. You want a match. I haven't got one. We'll Sorry. have to do that. The thing is, uh, anyway, the war is terrific, played a terrific part, didn't it? Well, it, you learned a certain extremism from war, and you, 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 you learned never to leave go of anything. And you also learned, uh, well, you see, I once compromised, and it's been on my conscience ever since. Let's just say that at a certain time in 1917, uh, I was only 20 at the time, but everybody else had been killed, so I was a captain. In fact, last week I cel celebrated my 50th year as a captain. <laughs> 50 years yeah, a captain? 50 years a captain. <laughs> we ought to call this program 50 years a captain. Well, um, I was required to attend a court martial on a deserter. Mm. And with the, uh, with the uh, notice came instructions from the corps that the man had to be shot. Well, now, in order to support morale. Well, now, this was a very grave thing because you can't direct justice in that way. A court has its own responsibility. And if I'd attended the court martial and had said, look here, I refuse to, uh, I object to the dictates of the court about influencing my, my verdict in this thing, I'd have been cashiered. Uh, I could have gone sick, that'd have been cowardly. Uh, I could have gone and, and sentenced the man to death, and that would that'd, that'd have destroyed me, you see. So I got out of it by, there was one other captain who was taking a spell in the trenches, and I took over his command, and he went to the court martial, had a nice time, he didn't mind. But I always felt that I, that I, well, I was only 20, and the judgment was wrong. And from then afterwards, I decided <coughs> never to be anybody's stooge never to take any instructions from anybody else. In other words, never to take a job in which I was responsible to anybody above me. Mm -hmm. And I kept that ever since. Yes, I think you have, and I think it's played a... a you know, it's, 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 it's something... It all started, it all started with that. Started that one incident. Yes. It's very interesting. 
in this war thing, of course, after the war, you met T. Lawrence and wrote about him and all mm. that, mm. very interestingly. What do you feel about him now? Do you feel the same as you did then? Oh, yes. I know much more about him. But he was my friend, and three times when I was nearly bankrupt, he came to my assistance. I know, that's marvellous. But the thing is... But he was a real man. Yes, but, but does it worry you, the things that have come out about him, does it, does it alter your judgment in any way? What things have come out? Well, I take a simple thing. I can never believe, and I know that you, I know that you've got this terrific feeling about people telling the truth. I can never believe that a person who is a sort of fantasist about himself is any good. Well, obviously, Lawrence was that, wasn't he? No, not a fantasist about himself. He was, uh, he was uh, very truthful about himself. But he told the most terrible lies, Robert. Only as a woman tells lies in order to protect a, uh, protect a secret. Not for self-glorification. After the uh, war and all that, then came marriage. What about marriage? No, during the war. During the war, just the end of the war. Yeah. What about that? I got Matchman. married. I had four children. Yes, I know. I knew one of them well. And the thing is, what? But but what do you feel about that? I mean, do you think matrimony is a good idea? I think a marriage should be restricted to the very few people capable of being married. About ten percent. And what about the others? And they should not be allowed to be married unless they jolly well can be married and are suitable for it. And the others, the whole. The whole um, the trend is, is, is against marriage now, and it's going back to the original position <coughs> in, um, in Europe and in, and in Arabia and in everywhere before patriarchal marriage came in, which a woman was completely free to take her husband, choose him, and discard him when she wanted to, and she kept the children. He had no responsibility for her, this is for the children system. at all. But doesn't all your white goddess business and so on mean that you rather incline to the view of the feminine as the dominant principle in life? That's what's happening now. I and agree. we can't stop it. The, um, the um, only thing is that, uh, that uh, patriarchy dies very hard. And what's really happened is, I've got a lecture about this at Oxford, quite soon. <laughs> it's a very good subject. <laughs> it's about uh, how we, first of all, never mind what happened first, because it's complicated. Then you, you had a matriarchy, then you had a patriarchy, now we have a meconarchy, that's the rule of the machine. And matriarchy and patriarchy are both destroyed by meconarchy. And I something see. else has got to happen. I see. And what's going to happen is one of the most exciting things. What do you think will happen then? You wait. <laughs> never tell me, give us some idea. Now, while people are looking at you, some well, I, think, I think somehow that the, the principle of magic, when I say, see, you say magic, and you don't people don't know the difference between magic and sorcery, even. But anyhow, the principle of magic will re establish itself. So and that, save us? And save a few. The rest can go to hell, will go to hell. But it'll save a few. There's always, an er there's al there's always an Noah's Ark, you know. Well, we're heading for a crash, we know that. Yes. Doesn't matter about what form the crash takes. We'll be all dead by that time. It's not going to happen for another. How long do you <coughs> think? Well, when's the population uh, explosion time for? I think <coughs> 2036, is it? Doesn't affect us then, does it? Well, I don't know. Because they may discover something to make us go on living, you know. They... Oh, God forbid. Would you like that, incidentally? Well, you know, it's happened. On three occasions, I would have been dead if something had, hadn't just been discovered <laughs> and enabled me to continue this existence. You mean that's through illness or something? Yes, illness mm. or wounds. Or wounds. This, this, that, and, that. and therefore, you think that if, if some, somebody produced something which enabled you to go on living indefinitely, you'd take it, would you? I doubt it if you would, really. You don't want to go on living, really. It depends who else is about. I see, what about being a professor? Of course, you were a professor before, actually, weren't you? Well, I'm a professor of poetry at Oxford, but that's the only, I think, I can say it's the only elective professorship in the, in the United Kingdom. But you were professor in Cairo, never forget that. That was a job given me by three friends of mine, Colonel Lawrence, uh, uh, Arnold Bennett, and John Buchan. You know I went there as a lecturer immediately after you. So that part of it It was Bonnie Don Bonnie Donway, yes. yes. But, but uh, I took the job because my wife was was 
ordered to go to a hot climate, and it's the only way I could get there. There's always another reason. I, I took the, this job at Oxford for uh, an entirely personal reason. What was it? I will not tell you. <laughs> how interesting, how intriguing, but you won't tell. No. Have you ever told anybody? Yes. But only privately? Yeah. You've never written it or anything? No. All right, well, we just have to accept the fact that it's something we don't know, that you took it for private reasons. Nothing to do with being Professor of Poetry at Oxford. Uh, you know, do you know, I, I think, Robert, that this applies to almost everything. I don't think anybody, I think everybody takes things for private reasons. Really. Of course they do, yeah. It's so all they Yes, it's all a pretense. Yeah, not, not a pretense, it's, it's, it's a... What is it? Convention, ritual. No, it's doing the right thing for the right reasons, but not, and, but not for the apparent reasons. Yes, well, that's what I mean. Isn't that and a pretense? And it's been a great success. I've had great fun there. Isn't that a pretense? Why no. do you take out the word pretense? I mean, if it's, if, it's, if it's you're seeming to do it for one reason and really doing it for another, isn't that a pretense? No. Is it very strenuous? Yeah, very strenuous. You don't get much dough for it, do you? Oh, no, it costs me about twice as much as, 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 as I get. So it's just for the glory? No, three times as much as I get. What about money? Do you think money is the thing that affects one's life much, a need for money? You joking? No, I'm not. Uh, well, <coughs> the other day I got ruined. But you mean you lost all your money? Yeah. How'd you do that? Uh, a, a fraudulent um, uh, chap who owned all my copyrights uh, went away with 10,000 pounds. Good God. I laughed like hell. You take it very seriously. Well, I mean, I don't think it's a particularly pleasant thing to happen. It's very, very funny. Oh, everything's funny in a way. It's done, you... me, done, done me a lot of good. Has it? Mm. Why? Because you're going to now write a lot of other things? No, I can't even write anything because there's a chap who owns all my copyright is in prison in Switzerland, and I can't write any, uh, uh, can't sign any more contracts. So you're a free man? Yeah. He's liberated you, He's this liberated man. Me, yes. yes. but that's good. That's an interesting point. Another thing, of course, connected with that, I like very much in you, is your humour. I've got no sense of humour. You haven't got a sense of humour. No. I quite agree with that, but you've got a hell of a lot of humour. Uh, humour being a sense of the ridiculous, a sense of the inappropriateness of things, of the absurdity of life. You've got a lot now of look that. at us here. Yes, I quite agree. Um, if you hadn't got that, you'd have died of melancholia. You've got a melancholic temperament. There's some of the black Irish in me. That's it. Yeah. You've got a real deep melancholic temperament. And that's been, you've been saved from that by this humour. Do you agree uh, with that? Now I'm lecturing you goes, instead of goes, asking goes, you goes, questions. It goes together. Instead of asking it you goes questions. Together. They do go together, of in course. In the Shabin especially. Yes, they do go together. Do you ever go to Ireland? No. <laughs> <laughs> I've been there twice. Or three times. And it? it's, it's so exactly like I've always remembered it. I come away again once. You don't like it, really? It, it frightens me. It's like going back into the womb, you know. Yes, I see that. Are you going to go on writing poetry forever, to the end of your life? Nobody knows. I don't even know if I have written poems. How do you mean you don't know? I'm saying, uh, as, as Robert Frost said, poet, uh, poet is a praise word, and you can't... You know, they, uh, I write poems, quotes, unquotes. You certainly do. And, and uh, they go on, and, and um, they're the only thing I'm really interested in, in in my work. This has been your life, in a way. Yes, I said somewhere that uh, I, write, I, I write poems, uh, I write prose, as a, a man uh, reads dogs in order to feed his cat. But you write poems because that's the thing. Because I damn well must. Yes. Yes. And that's the tragedy of the joke, wasn't it?